guess we can call this meeting to order then. Is everyone ready? Welcome, everyone. I hear, I imagine most of you are here for the public hearing. Um, I don't, if that's an official meeting, so we'll open the meeting officially. And um, would you guys like to, do you want to say something about it? No. I, sorry, I thought I said you raise your hand. No, okay. I imagined it. Why don't we start, do you guys want to present first? And then we'll ask people to speak. Um, I really have not had a formal presentation. Uh, what we have done is work on a response to the taking notes that we received. And I was just going to talk directly to that. Um, I think we're answering and responding to those questions that were asked. Um, and then going from there, up to any other questions that come up. I don't, I'm kind of fluid on this. All right. Is it okay if I tilt this screen up to <laughs> No, you can't do anything about it. <laughs> well, you said you're going to start, you're going to respond to a couple of the emails you received. So why don't we start there then? Okay. And I think I will go. You moved the, the speaker, so should I stay here or should I move? Can everybody hear me? Jim, you know, I, for some reason, want to fall alone. I guess nobody likes me, but you can come and sit here. I can here come and sit there? Go. Okay. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> well, we could scoot over and then uh, you could have this one. That's all right. Okay. Front and center. Yeah. I'm Jan Olson, Chair of Planning. With me is John. Um, we are expecting Gary, who is also on the Planning Commission. Um, our fourth member can't be here tonight. She's got a uh, work conflict. So um, I want to also thank the Select Board for having a public hearing uh, in such a quick manner. Um, we appreciate it. Uh, and I want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, and for those who had submitted questions to us prior to this email, um, we appreciated that so we had some time to um, think about how we wanted to respond to this. Um, we started this process, if I could start it like telling a story, back when the state in 2015 did their Shoreland Protection Act. And the Planning Commission, thinking about things, thought we would like to have our shoreland become very similar to what the State Protection Act shoreland was. So we evaluated um, our maps, some of which you can see up, up that is on the screen, and looked very carefully at all of the lakes and all of the parcels that are around the lakes and found that probably 60% of the parcels and the structures that are around our lakes are non-compliant. None of them met the three-acre limit. Uh, there were buildings where there probably shouldn't be, and that was the history behind it. And we also found a couple pop, uh, parcels that were in shoreland that had no lakeshore property, and we thought that was kind of strange, too. Um, so we thought it might be more appropriate if we were to have an overlay district similar to what the state had in their overlay district. And we, over the course of maybe a year and a half, I can't remember, time flies by, um, we wrote a draft of a proposal and we had three informational meetings in 2017, maybe 2018. One was at the Adamant Community Center, one was at the Maple Corner Community Center, and one was at the East Callis Rec Center. And I have to say that property owners from all of the lakes did show up and give us some feedback. And I would comment that probably um, the greatest um, positiveness in all of this 
uh, was that <clears throat> everybody that was at those meetings uh, did support the idea of having an overlay um, as opposed to a regular residential district. There was, however, continued um, kind of resistance to having an overlay as opposed to a three-acre shoreland district. And so what we decided to do as a planning commission is we evaluated the uh, permitted uses and um, DRB conditional uses um, of both the shoreland district as it exists today and the rural residential district as it exists today. And what we found is hardly any difference at all. Maybe no more than three different items were different. And so we took that information and said, well, we can make a rural residential as the underlying district for most, almost all, of the land that goes under uh, the shoreland overlay. And so that's what we did. There were two exceptions to that. There are two areas where the land in the underlying district is resource recreational. That is the east or the, the west side of Curtis Pond, owned by Patrick Malone, and all of the land around Little Mud Lake, or Little, I think it's Little Mud Pond, up in the northeast section of Callis. We wanted to keep that land resource recreational because it has a 10 acre minimum and thereby protecting all of that land around there. So we wanted to keep that land resource recreational. Again, that becomes very important relative to having an overlay. The other three, uh, other exception to that, which is very minor, there were three areas where uh, there is a little bit of a that village district under that, and that is that the southern tip of Adamer, the southern tip of Curtis Pond, and the southern tip of uh, Number 10 Pond. Uh, in those cases, the people in Adamant has said they would reduce, um, they wanted to reduce their village. North Callis wanted to increase their village, um, and we felt um, there was no comment about anything about the village center or the village area uh, <laughs> south of Curtis Pond. So we, we just sort of left those as they are. Um, so what's in the overlay? And this becomes, I think, extremely important. All lakes have a buffer of 100 feet. And that buffer is a vegetative buffer. Um, as we worked through this with some members of of, of the town, we, only ca we almost called it the Holy Land. We want it to be kept the buffer as much as possible. <clears throat> now, can you have a six foot wide trail? Absolutely. The state allows it and we allow it. It's exempt. You can have a six foot trail in the buffer and in the upland. It's a granted. But there are other issues that are there in that buffer area. Even though the state requires uh, registration for a cleared, a new cleared area that is a 100 square feet of new impervious surface located between 25 to 100 feet of the mean water level, meaning even though the state can allow that in the buffer zone, the Planning Commission felt it would be very important to have no new development in the buffer area. And you will find that in one of the standards that we have. But we also had to understand and acknowledge that there are a lot of houses, there are a lot of cottages, and there are other sheds that are already and have historically been in the buffer. And we know you're going to have to maintain that. Um, and so what is also built into these regs are that says any reconstruction of a structure that's currently in the buffer that as long as there's no change in height or building can be done without a permit. Um, so we recognize that the existing structures 
uh, do need maintenance. And for those who want to add to an existing structure and adding it to the back, you're going to have to go to the DRB for conditional use review. It's adding impervious surface in a buffer zone that is to be basically 100% vegetative cover. Um, some people have said, is that too extreme? We take it as no. We say maybe it's a little step forward to responsible stewardship for the water quality of the lake of which this is next for future generations. And that's where we're coming from as we developed these regulations. In the upland zone, which is the second portion, so you have your lake region, you have your buffer of 100 feet, and then you have an upland. And that's usually 150 feet, so that the total shoreland overlay is 250 feet, with, of course, an exception. And we're going to talk about that. Um, and that exception is the eastern side of Curtis Pond, which has an overlay of 700 feet. What I'd like to really stress to you is that anything under in the upland, you can do anything in that. The underlying region and the underlying district is rural residential. And you can get a permit to do structures in that upland zone. There are several exceptions. We, not, we don't allow garden centers, extraction, or um, salvage yards to be built. And that's just an exclusion. Uh, bed and breakfast goes to the DRB. And I keep pointing to her thinking she's still on DRB, and she isn't. But anyway, um, so there are certain minor exceptions. But basically, you can do an, a, a whole lot in the upland zone because the underlying region is your rural residential region. There are two couple caveats, though. You cannot go beyond 10% of impervious surface in that area. That is no different than the shoreland regulations you have now. Historically, we have had 10% impervious surface, and we're keeping it at 10% impervious surface in the shoreland overlay. The other difference was the ability to calculate what is cleared land in the upland area. 40% of the land that is in the upland zone, only the upland zone, 40% can be cleared. We're keeping that. That's what the state has, and this is what Callis has. So if you decide that you have and you want to put a building or a structure of some kind in the upland zone, those are two of the most important caveats that you have to remember when you're doing that, the 10% impervious surface and how much of this is 40% cleared. I might say now, why is, because the question was asked, why is the east side of Curtis Pond so unique that it has an 800-foot overlay? The answer to that question is one word, density. When you look at this map and you see all of those little tiny parcels, you are looking at parcels that are no bigger than 0.25 of an acre, 0.3 of an acre, 0.4 of an acre, 0.5 of an acre. And on each one of them, pretty much almost every one of them, there is a cottage or a year-round house. And over the course of the years, how much has this overpopulation created a possible um, problem or hindrance to quality of water? I don't know how many times sitting around other things I've heard people complain about issues of the septic area around there. So in order to, um, the density over the years has possibly helped in the degradation of the lake. It was our belief then as stewards for the future of the lake, to have a greater amount of up upland on that section where all the protective standards for, um, for proper uh, management of your property and of the, of the uh, 
management of the standards as, as, is, as is advertised in the Shoreland uh, Protection Act, as stewards of that, that upland um, you extended is a measure probably to mitigate, if you will, the density on that side of the lake. I think it was John who said in one of those, or maybe it was Noreen, um, we've loved the lake too much. And so it is. So now it's time, and I would say, uh, let me put it this way too, and I know some of you may not like this comment, but Curtis Pond Association went out and promoted the idea that the town could help with the Curtis Pond Dam. And one of the things that you mentioned in all of that was the uh, degradation of property values on Curtis Pond if the dam was not repaired. Likewise, I would say the town is, is asking for almost a quid pro quo. Can you put in a little extra effort of protecting the land by having a little bit of extra upland in an effort to keep your property values up, keep the water quality up, um, and protect it for the future generations? So that's where the Planning Commission is coming from. One of the other things that was mentioned in the emails that had come through was mowing. <laughs> we have a story about mowing. When we first started this uh, and had our meetings, we initially had a, a fact that you would mow, uh, if you mowed more than one, one time a year, um, it was considered you could not mow anymore. And at those meetings, <laughs> Um, somebody said that wasn't fair. That wasn't fair to the um, people that are out of state that owned the cottages and they come, sometimes couldn't get there more than maybe every 15 months. And so we considered that possibility after that meeting and we said, <laughs> okay, we'll go to two years and we'll give it to two years and say if you mow, you can, you can mow, uh, maintain one mowing every two years, but if you don't mow after two years, after that point in time, um, it becomes you can no longer mow. We made that a condition not only in the shroud, but also a condition in 3.14, which is the protection of surface waters. But because we received this question about mowing, um, we sought out some advice from some people in the Shoreland Protection Act, and thanks to Melanie, um, she, we, we did get a response, and I would like to share that response from the Shoreland Protection Aid, uh, Agency relative to the question about mowing and lawns, especially as it relates to the shoreland. Their response was, quote, SPA has no definition of lawn but use the definition of cleared area. Because of that, I have I've uh, shared with you three definitions that I think are very important. Vegetative cover, what is a lawn, and what is a cleared area. And because the cleared area is what the SPA uses for their work, I think it's important to know what a cleared area is. An area where existing vegetative cover, soil, tree canopy, or duff has been permanently removed or altered, except when managed according to the vegetation protection standards. Laura of SPA went on to state the following. Generally, when we communicate to the public, we consider cleared areas to be developed areas. Grass lawns, landscaped areas, which includes gardens and decorative areas, maintained areas, rock outcrops, ledge, and bare soil. So, and, and think about that definition of cleared area, especially as it relates to your upland area, because that's where your 40% is, cleared area. Occasionally, the public reaches out to us about maintaining an area that was previously mowed, cleared, that has since revegetated. Once a previously cleared area re-naturalizes, it becomes protected vegetation, 
We don't have a set timeline of when something that re-naturalizes. The wetlands program may, and we chose not to go to the wetlands for that uh, definition. Typically, we ask folks their maintenance schedule. And if we learn that the property was routinely brush hogged once a year, and then it has not been for four years, we say that it has re-naturalized. It's a little bit of a judgment call. But if it has fallen out of its usual routine of maintenance, then it is no longer a cleared area. Given that explanation from the state, and we have in our record, in our proposed regs, that we want the mowing to be every two years. And by the way, we still have people who would prefer to have no mowing at all. So this is definitely a compromise. But two years, if you can try to maintain your brush hogging every once every two years, you want, where you're not going to have a renaturalization of your land. Now, by the way, again, this is only the cleared area. What you do in your property outside of the shoreland overlay is totally whatever you want to do. We are talking only about the overlay here. Um, so those are the definitions. Um, the other question that was asked was, how do we all differ from the Shoreland Protection Agency um, definitions? Well, obviously, the first one was about the roads. If you have a road that intersects um, either the buffer or the upland area, we do expect uh, maintenance on both sides of that road um, to follow uh, the guidelines of the vegetation protection standards. The second one is we are at 10% impervious surface. The state is still at 20, but we kept it at our historical level of 10. Um, our cleared area has a little bit of a different measurement. It's 40%, but it's 40% only of the upland area that you have. And our slopes are different. The state slopes are 20%, ours are 15%. And I'm hoping that you will all understand where we're coming from. We believe it to be responsible stewardship for our future and improvement of water quality to have these kinds of standards. And that's the all I have prepared in answer to these um, the emails that we received. Um, and now I guess we open it up to further questions. Okay. Let me start with hey, this. I have a process question. Sure. Can I ask it now? Okay. <laughs> yeah, just I don't know. I came in like a little bit, like a minute after. I don't know if you did. You no, we explained. didn't talk okay. about process. So I'd like to know what the uh, role of the select board is now. I'm just not clear what happens. This oh, is the oh, select okay. board is holding this hearing. What is the select board going to do? What can the select board do? Yep. Then what happens? Um, following this hearing, if uh, the select board may make changes or not, if we make substantive changes, we have to hold another hearing like this one. If we make no changes, then we have two options. Correct me if I say anything wrong here. We have two options. One is we can uh, adopt it by majority vote of the select board. The other is, and we're, we're uh, intending at the moment anyway to do this one, is to warn it for a public vote by Australian ballot. And that would probably be a month following whenever we decide we're satisfied with it. So it doesn't get sent back to the planning committee? I mean, if you disagree, We might send it back to them. You can send it back to the planning committee. We could send it back to them to make changes that we do. And the, we do, well, yeah. the key word is substantive changes. Yeah, the key undefined word. Mm -hmm. Is that answer? Substantive. Yeah. OK. <laughs> um, so let me ask the select board first. Do you have any questions about this that you want to ask Jan or John? Uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, did, uh, so there is an upland overlay in the, in the current regulations. Um, the current regulations. Oh, we changed the name. Okay. We're using the state name for the land area around ponds. So it right. used to be our upland. It's now the Dallas Highlands. Gotcha. Can everybody hear that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, and uh, the so second question um, uh, is relative to the kind of extension of the upland region. Was was that boundary 
uh, defined by any particular land feature. Yes. Um, it follows the 800 foot concrete uh, shape of the uh, of the existing shoreline district, especially at the southern end of Curtis, where it's based on landforms and ledge and stuff. It follows that 800 foot line until it gets to Camp Road, and then I arbitrarily chose Camp Road as the place to bring it back and then intersect the 250 foot. <coughs> Um, yeah, I guess I have a comment on that. One of the observations that I have with that extension, and you know, received some comment on on you know why why that buffer got extended, and and why I hear and understand what Jan was saying about the density on that side of the pond. The extension appears to largely go over onto parcels that don't have properties that are immediately on the shoreline. And so it seems a bit like extending an overlay onto parcels that you have it uh, over on the east end. Well, I know, but... <coughs> oh, okay. Go ahead. Yeah, finish your question. So, you know, it, and, and I'm going to use the term penalized for a severe lack of other other words, but it seems like that that extension of of that overlay um, is is kind of disproportionately affecting parcels and property owners who are who are not immediately on the shoreline and had contrib contributed to that kind of degradation. Um, and the other conflict that I see. Um, is that those are fairly large parcels that are pretty close to a down, downtown or village center. Um, and should we, as a community, want to encourage further development in one of the village centers, that could restrict development in those larger, and further subdivision in those larger parcels. You're asking several questions here. <laughs> so many questions. And, and John, help me as we, we talk about this. Okay, the first thing about um, what we do, or what happens, you, you are right, some of these are larger parcels. But the way the flow of water goes, where do you think it goes? Does it go up or does it go down? And so everything that is here affects eventually going down this way. And the better you have, I don't want to say control, but... No, I, yeah, I understand that. I mean, that's what... what and so that's where, what yep. why we are doing it this way. Plus, this is the existing shoreland that you have now. Mm -hmm. And so we just kind of kept it there. Now, when we talk about the village area here, I can't remember exactly what your question was <laughs> on that. Would it restrict building and development? <coughs> no, it does Well, it could and it could. But the other thing I think, John, no, the thing that, that is very interesting about this set of um, standards that we are proposing is something called River Corridor, which has a lot greater effect than anything in Shoreland. And I think. One of the issues of River Corridor is something right coming out here. We aren't allowing building in River Corridor. So yeah, there is going to be not the availability to create a good commercial, if you want to call it that, village center in our designated village centers. Mainly because we have River Corridor. And then the perennial issues of water and so and, and that, that certainly affects, I mean, yes, that is the conundrum that the Planning Commission has. I believe, Stephanie, in your letter to the Planning Commission, you asked for a 1,000 foot buffer instead of an 800 foot buffer. I'm sorry, I can't hear you, John. You wrote a letter to the Planning Commission that was read into the minutes when we had a select board presentation. And I believe you called for a 1,000 foot buffer instead of 800 foot? No. I'm no? 500 feet. Five. 
I said 500 feet because we had uh, the Conservation Commission had seen and 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 looked at and studied um, information coming from the Department of Environmental Conservation that 500 feet is the optimal distance to protect water quality. Oh, so you wanted 500 feet? We wanted 500 feet everywhere. everywhere. Okay. Yeah, that's what it was, not 1,000 feet, but it was 500 feet everywhere, based on these studies that showed that 500 feet is the optimal distance to protect water quality. Okay. Jordan, are you all set for now? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Gabrielle. Um, um, what, uh, we talked a little bit at the other public hearing about um, the dam construction. Can you talk a little bit about how the dam renovation project would be affected by these new zoning regs? I think the, the answer to that is, uh, where do we have this? I know there's something, some language in here that um, we state approved dam repair or replacement is exempt from review under CALA zoning regulations. We have nothing to do with the dam. Now, whether or not that meets the State Protection Act's stabilization of a shore, I have no idea. Uh, and that's going to be an SPA thing. But, um, and I think the Curtis Pond Association have applied for, um, I believe, from from the state um, for shoreland protection agency. But that's all the permits. These are not. Uh, we have no, you know, a state-approved dam thing. We we can't touch. So your response is you don't give a damn. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, Jordan. <laughs> um, I the Upland uh, region, you had mentioned that there aren't very many restrictions, so to speak, just kind of extra considerations, and mm -hmm. those specific restrictions were more kind of protections against kind of commercial operations that would be in that specific watershed, but you had mentioned extraction, and I was wondering if that included forestry uses or approved forestry uses or No, if you're just, doing forest silvy thing, that's all that's already that's exempted all. in one point yeah. five. Yep. As is anything egg. Um, but yeah, in, in looking at all of that, um, basically every permitted use in the upland is as, as allowed in the underlying district. Yeah. Um, the exception is a bed and breakfast. Um, and there you've got issues to go to the DRB, you've got parking um, other things to go on and a small scale telecommunications facility. Some of us absolutely wanted that out, but we're keeping it in. Um, and then, of course, any change excluding reconstruction to a non conforming use or structure. Those go to the DRB. And um, in terms of uh, the upland, the, those three things that are absolutely not allowed those are the extraction and quarrying, salvage yards, and garden centers. And the reason why garden centers was mentioned because of sure. the potentiality of yeah, yeah. Right. All right. I have a quick oh, question. you're welcome. Um, <laughs> just to shift gears for one second to the river corridor overlay, I couldn't figure out easily on a quick read. My recollection is it's a 50 foot wide. Is that 50 feet either side of the stream? Yeah. Yes. And is it? like follow the shore exactly or from the kind of center average of the center of the stream 50 and other feet. Right. Figured you'd get into that if you respond with the response <laughs> in your chat. <laughs> um, we've also received several written statements. I think I'll wait to see because I think some of you are here and may want to speak and if you would like to read this that's fine. So uh -huh. let's find out who would like to speak. I'm oh, sorry, I do no just have, yeah, I'm sorry about that. It's okay. Um, so, we, Jan, you mentioned that um, the river, uh, or the, what did you call it, the surface? River corridor. The river corridor. And, and the flood hazard overlay and the river corridor overlay. And the river corridor overlay is brand new. But the whole flood hazard was totally rewritten. So, when you look at a map of Callus now, 
We have a huge amount of wetland, and we have a huge amount of river corridor. And yes. Okay, so you mentioned that those are more impactful in your mind than the shoreland mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just wondering if there is some kind of a fact sheet about that or something that um, would help people wrap their heads around it and understand like what are the top 10 effects of, of those new pieces of it. Help me out. Okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> The river corridor, I, I don't know if we, if we had the map up. We, we, do you have part of that map here on this one? I don't know. Happy to yeah, Okay, you see, he'll fiddle with it while he does this. The river corridor, the reason why I say it affects most of Calus is because the rivers come, there's, there's here through Kent, there's um, all of the area um, south of Adamant. Um, there is a river corridor out of East Callis. There's, you, you can see the big orange blobs, or if you want to call it that, that go along the way. In addition, river corridor has something called, um, the, they have these streams um, of which they are identified as being part of river corridor stream. They're not mapped as river corridor, but they, they are gauged there because of some um, speed of the water that it's going to the flow. I don't know. Yeah, how long? That's to do with the, um, size, the drainage size of the watershed. That's like sort of the cutoff point that the state uses. And if it's, uh, if the drainage area is above a certain threshold, I don't remember what that is, but then it's, it's mapped to what the, um, the river really needs to uh, satisfy its migration path over time. So that's what the river corridor really means. It's like, where is it going to go as it moves around? And when it gets below that certain threshold, then it gets into the 50, 25 feet. Right. And those become those bright little red lines throughout the state, throughout our, our town. And those also have a 50 foot wide buffer on each side, supposed to. Now, the reason why we kept all of that going is because that is part of river corridor in order for us to get ERAF, the extra 5% emergency funding relief. And so it's become part of River Corridor. Um, let's see, anybody in the back row want to speak? If so, raise your hand. Colleen, Colleen you wrote something. Uh, Noreen, I mean, Noreen. Uh, my name is Maureen Ryan, and I'm just speaking for the Callis Lakes and Streams Committee. We sent a statement in to you, and um, I guess I'll just basically just say that we support the provisions and the changes, the amendments to the shoreland zoning as they're being proposed by the uh, Planning Commission to you. The, the statement is longer than that. However, Jan covered much of what I had said in the statement. I don't think it needs to be repeated. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in the back row? Let's go to the middle row. Who wants to speak? I, I, I know speak. you do, Marge. Do you want to come up? You're welcome to come up or just speak from there, whatever you like. No, I'll come up. I'd like to see if we could get the map up. Which map? Of oh, the Curtis Pond? Yeah, okay. I can do that. Um, does anyone else here have internet? I uh, seem to. I do. I can't get it. Uh, we need to grab a wire. <laughs> I can't get it. I can't get it. And interrupt to get the names of people who speak. I am getting too. as we go. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's all the people that I am on. Oh, that's good. Yeah. That's the nice one. Yeah. Um, I'm Marge Sweeney, and my kids speak. Um, we sent a letter in, and I'm not going to read the whole, whole letter, but we own one of these, we own this piece of property here, um, and our concern is we are being treated differently than all the other, than most of the other people on the lakes um, in Calus. Uh, we, I don't, this is a big piece of property, um, I don't, I don't want, um, and so I don't, I don't understand the, the density issue when I see smaller 
ones around here that are, were not included. So I'm not, we, have, we don't have an issue with the 250 foot um, for a man, but extending that, that 700 feet into a piece of property, I just don't think is that we are being treated fairly and uh, as the other people in the, in the, the town. Um, well, I don't, we, we've been managing this land, we kind of, we have trails in here, a lot of people in the town use them, we're happy that they do. Um, I don't want to have to worry about any time I want to do something in that piece of property, you have to go in front of a board. Our experience with the council boards haven't been as positive as, as I, and I don't want to have to deal with that every time I want to put a trail up there. But you wouldn't have to, Marge. It, because you're oh, doing, no, you're doing as, rural residential. You're, you, it, no, this is short land, over land. No, but, but the upland, this, this portion, <laughs> then this portion from here to here is upland. And the underlying, this it has different, this it, is a rural residential. It doesn't have, does it have the exact same rules as these properties here? Yes, you've got 40%. Limit and uh, limit to ten percent impervious. Then why do you have why do you put, uh, we all know that once um, regulations start, that's just the, the next step. Of what will be the next step? Why are we not being treated like the rest of the because of the intent like? the intensity of the population on the east side? And we understand. I understand that you think that you have a larger piece of property. Uh, I don't know what to say about that other than what what essentially does happen is the way the land and the stormwater management and, and erosion and potential erosion can do going flowing down towards that and other there's area. and there's rivers coming out and there's things here and there's mm -hmm. beaver dams up in here and yet they're not in this Piece of, uh, Jan, didn't you say there are some things that she can't do now, like, for example, have an extraction facility that um, she could do if it weren't, if it were just in the rural residential and not in the shoreland? Well, uh, then they would have to go to the guidelines of what are the extractions in 4.4. There's only so much limit that you can do. But if you have an extraction, I don't care whether it's 250 or, or the 700, but it, it it's what you are doing is creating it, something that affects well, another going in erosion down. No, I understand that, but I, but I just to respond to Marge's question, you also said she can't have a garden center, whereas she could a business. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so there is a property right next door to us, fifty feet away, can put a garden center in. Not that I ever would consider putting a garden center, <laughs> but you yeah. have one regulation, and then next next year it's another regulation. So, um, and I don't see the difference between these and these down here and, and all of the properties that are through here. So that I just don't think would be treated the same as the other lakes. Uh, they don't have uh, an extended and, um, and, and the rest of the Curtis Pond. If anything, there should be some more properties you might have wanted. That aren't any aren't unique to, to us. So um, that's basically all I want to say. I didn't know Steve and I. Um, I didn't know if you wanted to add anything to that. <coughs> I just find that the, the only thing I, um, you know, I appreciate all the hard work that's gone into this, and, and uh, but I just would like to see consistency. You know, mm -hmm. I would prefer us to match up with the state. I mean, now it's, you know, you got to go to the state, <clears throat> we have to go to, you know, and, and they're different. And that's the, uh, you know, I, the regulations, you know, for instance, you know, 10% versus 20%, you know, so it's just, mm -hmm. that's the, the, the only part that, mm -hmm. that I, I I understand because that was one of the things that yeah, the people well, first said was that they wanted it to be exactly like the state. Yeah. But we had a lot of pushback on that. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I understand. Can I just ask a question related to that? Aren't there areas of like Nelson Pond and uh, Number 10 Pond where there are a number of camps that, 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 that 
I mean, so how? They are, but they don't have the density of population. In other words, I think in Nelson Pond, um, where Wilson lives and around in there, there's not that many. <coughs> And, and when we looked at that, yeah, they had not the intensity, not the intensity of what's on the east side. But uh, our response. land, a lot of it is over 200 feet back from the water. And yet we're being penalized, to use your word, for having that property on the eastern side. And I just want to make a comment to your comment, Jan, concerning the effort on the dam that you proved the statement no good deed goes unpunished. John wants to say I just want to mention that. Take a look at it. If you think you can beat it singled out, everything you're seeing in Crosshatch is people that were in res rural residential, but now there are severe restrictions on what they can do with their property. That's the whole idea of this. Um, so it's not like it's not like you're being singled out for something tough. Everybody, everybody in the shoreland being singled out and there are restrictions on development. To uh, 700 feet back? What you can do between 250 and 700, uh, I'm not sure that you could prove. It's rural residential, so you got a three acre minimum. So that, that's, uh, that's, the, that's the density of development that you can do there. Um, I suppose you could do the garden center thing. We could take that out and put an alley there. Um, <laughs> And that, that's where this garden center came from. Someone worried that bags of fertilizer would break open and flow into the water. In, in regards to what Marge is asking, did, did you talk about, I, I'm Pauline Bloom. I see you. Did you talk about just drawing the 700 feet all the way around the pond? I mean, was it discussed? Just, you know, so everybody is the same. I just wondered if the planning commission um, talked about that. Well, uh, on that issue, we did. But the issue on the west side is totally, re I mean, that is resource recreational. And it has a larger acreage per minimum at 10 acres. So um, the issue was only about the eastern side of Curtis Pond, to be honest. Um, uh, and Why not the northern? Well, yeah, we could have made it up that way. And like John said, it was kind of an arbitrary thing that he kept it at Camp Road. That's the terrace we have right now. <coughs> That's the Shoreland District now. We have to comply with the Shoreland standards. And I, I don't have issues with that. It's putting that pink back, whatever that is. Because <laughs> that has restrictions to things we can do. This is the same thing. It this is not is, restricted. This is a bigger area. I don't know where you're getting it. I'll, I'll turn the pink one back on. I gotta shoot my mouth. Can't the pink one. There's the pink one. So you can see that the green is much better bigger than the pink. Well, why can't we be in the green instead of the pink? That's all I'm asking. You are in the green right now. No, but. And you've got the three acre minimum. You've got, in fact, right now, the distance you're allowed to construct from the water is 150 feet. And our new regs is 100 feet. OK, shall we move on? Mm -hmm. Anybody else in the middle row here want to speak? Just, um, can you just clarify the blue? Oh, can you put that back up, John? The blue, the light mean? blue, which um, Would you state your name for Ann? Oh, um, Meg Dobbins. Ah, I almost had it. I would have gotten it. <laughs> so close. John, I'm just curious, John. Um, uh, how is the the light blue, the restrictions in the light blue area different? Um, I, I recognize. Well, the, the light blue, the, the, the light blue is what is current. And you don't have the same buffer that's current. You don't have the same 40% um, restriction of, uh, you want to call it a restriction of, of clearing land. None of that is in any of the current shoreland district. And the green is showing the current shoreland district. So that will go away. With, once, yes, because so the, it will just be the, the, the overlay pink. is the pink. pink. The pink overlay that Marge didn't like. 
I get it. Only on part of it. I understand. <laughs> okay. Front row, Stephanie, if you want to see, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> So now, I'm Stephanie Kaplan, and I'm here both representing the Conservation Commission and also myself personally. Um, for both of us, the Commission and myself, we just, we think that the Planning Commission just did a magnificent job. They worked really, really hard, and they were very, very open to suggestions from both the, the uh, Conservation Commission and the Lakes and Streams Committee um, in areas where they were initially concerned. Um, so we, the Conservation Commission um, totally supports these provisions. I think there's just substantial better protection of the water quality. Um, I think so too, although I have a few things that um, I don't agree with. And the, one of the reasons I asked about the process question is that none of my concerns are big enough that I would want this not to go through. I mean, this is, you know, they're, in a way, they're minor. And I don't think they're so minor, but they really are minor compared to this overall um, major improvement and, and better protection of Dallas's water quality. But I just wanted to say, um, I, the Planning Commission has heard from me several times about this, and there's just a couple things that I just wanted to emphasize. And one of them is the issue that John just raised about the extent of the, um, well, now it's the overlay. I mean, right now, the zoning regulations provide a shoreland district that is 800 feet from the ponds and lakes. And so going to 250 feet with this overlay is a major reduction in that, um, that more stringent protection that is given around the ponds and the lakes. And as I said, uh, you know, the Planning Commission, the, the Conservation Commission, we had a conversation, I can't remember if it was with the Planning Commission, it's like, where did that 800 foot buffer come from, or the 800 foot uh, shoreline just come from? And nobody knew. Where oh, it, it seemed very arbitrary. Oh, no, we had it. It was art that was pretty arbitrary. We had it in our minutes. Right. Uh, not, we have it. We have it in our planning commission minutes, going back to 2016, with Larry Bush in attendance, mentioning about the 800 foot. Well, we, so then we looked. You know, we looked into it. We talked to people and got this information from the Department of Environmental Conservation. They had a they had a chart about different distances from lakes and ponds and which are the best for protecting water quality, and it was 500 feet. So I still think it should be 500 feet because it's based on science, as opposed to just a, a number. I remember that chart. There were different stages. It's, I think, 50 feet for one animal species, and 100 and 200. And, and it didn't have anything to do with water quality that I saw. It had to do with habitat. You're, you're right. It was both. I think it was both, John. I think that as it, it went out, it was different species. Water quality. And then after yeah. that, it was all habitat. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah you're right. Um, but we care about the habitat and, this, and the, uh, the creatures as well as the water quality. So, you know, the, the area around lakes and ponds is, and, and rivers and streams is critical for uh, wildlife habitat of all sorts. Anyway, um, the, the other, I just want to make a comment. Uh, I'm on the Development Review Board, and this is about overlays. And we had a application some months ago. It was in, I think it was in the Upland overlay area. And it was so confusing trying to apply two different standards. Um, so, you know, for that reason too, as a member of the DRB, I don't want things to be any more complicated than they have to be. And I think the overlay complicates things in a way that's maybe not necessary. Um, and then I have a, 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 just an issue about slopes. 
The um, state, I believe, allows 20% slopes. I mean, so you've gone down to 15%. And, you know, we, there was an issue, and I'm sure a lot of people here are aware of it, that there was a driveway built um, across the Nelson Pond, and I believe it was 14% grade. I think, John, that's what you said at the time. And it, there was a mess, and it caused a huge amount of erosion, and it was really a problem because they're right across, they're right across the road from Nelson Pond, and it was 14% is very steep. And it was so interesting because it gave us and me a visual picture of what a slope, a 14% slope is. I wouldn't have like, been able to really visualize it, but there it was, and there it still is. Um, it was somebody building a driveway that was an accessory use to a house that's, that, that's all along that road, Nelson Pond Road. So anyway, that is one of the reasons, and it was just an issue of curb cut, and that's one of the reasons the Conservation Commission spent so much time working on a new curb cut ordinance so that something like that wouldn't happen again. And so it's a little dismaying to see the shoreland zoning regulations allowing development up to, up to 15% close to the ponds and lakes. And I, I just, just think that is not necessary, and I'm not sure, the, why, I'm not sure why it has to be that steep. And I, I just, I mean, you should all go driving along Nelson Pond Road and look up at that driveway. It's 14%. And you can see how steep it is. And it's just, as I said, it was, it was a, just such a visual image of what, what a 14% slope is um, and what the potential consequences are when, they're, when there's runoff and erosion when you're that close to a lake. So those are, those are my main things. And the whole knowing thing, you know, you know I don't agree with you, but, you know. <laughs> I was smiling at you when I said that. I know, you know. <laughs> I've said it a million times. You know, it's, if you really, if Callis really cares about protecting the water quality, there's tons of studies and information about how lawns are not, or cleared areas, are not adequate to protect against runoff and, uh, and pollution and stuff into the lakes and ponds compared with, you know, gr grown up vegetation, grown up native veg vegetation. And you do allow a six foot path to the lakes and the ponds. And so, you know, it's not as though people's access is being taken away. But anyway, I know you're not going to change. So. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Okay. Anybody else? Anybody? Oh, yes. So I, I just, I'm John mm -hmm. Rosenblum, John. and um, okay. I own an unmapped water uh, area. Mm -hmm. I call it Curtis Swamp. No one's ever okay. named it. it. Used to be called Frog Hollow, according oh, to Frog Forever Callus. Um, I'm not sure why it's not mapped, because it's a, it's a very, very fertile uh, wildlife area, and it's just, it's, I have the property that's the edge of the yellow where it starts going checkered on the south side of Curtis Swamp. Right. So you're, you have your finger in Curtis Swamp now, so, um, yes, so, um, so who knows why Callis chose not to map. That's what that water area, wetland, got um, but it may be wetland. Well, not wetland features. Oh, okay. So, yeah, this, so we have no. I have apparently no restrictions. I can build <laughs> cements, <laughs> but <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. So I have never seen a restriction. It is on the maps, Jordan. Found okay. Anyway, um, I'm I'm thinking about. The long term, you know, Callis land value in Callis is to a large extent based on our water and on our ponds and our streams. And um, we have an ever increasing recreation um, economy here. Um, Maple Corner um, is the center of a lot of recreation. There's probably 30 miles of, of bike and walking paths. Um, we, and right around Maple Corner, we've been walking distance of Maple Corner, supported by the property owners. Um, I think the quote uh, you were quoting me, but I, I, I don't know if you're quoting me, but, but I said that um, 
we, Curtis Pond was being loved to death. Um, and that's true. Um, when I came here in 2001, uh, you could swim in the area around the dam. Now it's all lily pads, just about, except where Don you know, rigorously ride, drives his boat over and over and over again to try to keep the lily pads from, from taking over the whole place. Um, there's lily pads at the southern end um, of, of the pond, you know, up to the boat access. Um, that are that that there's a dock there you can see on the on the house that's on the very southwestern side um, that is surrounded by lily pads and can't be used anymore. When I came in 2001, that dock was still being used. So what we're watching is the Curtis Pond is filling in with lily pads. The whole top um, past Colleen's is, is not just lily pads, it's, it's actually starting to be land. Um, and, um, and so the pond is disappearing. We're spending, we've bonded $450,000 to repair the dam. Uh, we've raised $250,000 additionally from donations of the community. This pond is, is super valuable, it's at least worth $650,000, it's probably, but we know from evaluating the, uh, its impact on the um, grand list that it's worth uh, millions of dollars over the course of, of 20 years. Um, and, um, and we also know that the Maple Corner store depends upon the pond to, for its survival. I'm the president of the board of the Maple Corner store Without the pond, we don't think the store would survive. Um, the store is, is, is the cultural center of, of Maple Corner and, and West Dallas. So um, I'm just, I'm not gonna say anything about specific rules. Um, I, I'm happy that the commission has, has, has worked on this. I support, I support adopting this plan um, as it is. Uh, I think adding the streams to, to protection is very important. Um, and having the, the road uh, crew uh, continue to improve the runoff situation, um, you know, and also to maintain the runoff situation. Um, there's, there's places where the road crew has, has created settling ponds, which are now full and overflowing of silt and haven't, haven't been maintained. Um, so, you know, we need to figure out how to do that. Um, we need to figure out the last houses that are polluting the pond with sewage. Um, I know of one house that had gray water going into the pond up until five years ago. There may be others. Um, we need to figure that out and, and solve those problems. We need to slow down the death of Curtis Pond as much as possible. It's going to die, and some, some of us are going to live long enough probably to see it die. Die as a pond. I mean, that won't bother the, you know, the wildlife that likes wetlands, but, um, but it'll bother the economy of Calais, and it'll bother our grandchildren. Our, and, and so we need to maintain this, and we need to do things, even if they're uncomfortable and convenient, uh, we need to really take care of our of, of our ecology. Um, so, I, and of all of Calais, not just Curtis Pond, but all the wetlands, all the streams, and all the ponds. So that's just my statement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've also got a few more letters uh, um, in support and one which expresses some concerns about mowing and asking for a different schedule. But in the interest of time, I'd like not to read them unless anybody particularly wants to hear them, and I can certainly make them available to you or read it because they wrote it. No. Will they be posted on the website then? Uh, we could do that. Uh, would you like to speak? Me? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I thought I saw you. Um. Did you, did you talk about the mowing situation at the Curtis Pond swimming area? We, 
You mean as part of the planning? Hmm? You mean as part of the planning regulations? Yes, because I, I don't Resilient. think that's mowed two times a, every two years. It's mowed less frequently, but I don't think they want to lose the, the cleared area there. The swim area for people who haven't swum there, there's a sort of a sandy beach and a grassy side. All right. And First thing is, um, what you are doing now, well, you will continue to do. New regulations go into effect when there is a permit for a new application to do something. And that is the time when John, as the zoning administrator, has only the power to enact those changes, unless somebody reports to him that something is going wrong. So I, I, we did not talk about anything about the mowing of the, of the Curtis Pond area, because it's, it's going to continue on as it is right now. You're not doing any new development, really, except for building rails. But they're mowing less than every two years. Well, can it be changed? Then what? Can it be changed to mow every two years? I don't know. I don't know who's in charge of it. No idea. Well, the state says if you don't mow in a four-year period, it's yep. renaturalizing, so you lost it then. So you either do it for two years or three years. <clears throat> what, but the what? question is, if they don't, if they mow, if they mow that swimming area every three years. Who's a they? I, I, I don't know who mows it, but it's um, the town. If they wait yeah. three years and then mow it, three years and don't mm. mow it, then can they never mow it again? Correct. According, if if in fact there's some new so, development that. So the regulations are going to force them to more mow it more frequently than they want to. Not just them, but people who've got property along rivers, uh, other ponds, streams. These mowing these mowing standards apply to every stream in town, if you be on the side of it. Every pond, not just not just these shoreland protection ponds. Every pond has a 50-foot buffer, and and if it's mowed, if you don't mow it in four years or th two years by our eggs, you're giving it up. Do you want to say something? No, I mean I see the the point that that does encourage more mowing than one might do mm -hmm. by having it required every two years versus every five years. Yeah, but by the time well, you've got it. Right. Yeah, and, and, and you're renaturalizing. What you're doing is right. renaturalizing, and what they say the state is, you've renaturalized it, you can't mow anymore. So if you don't want to mow, I know it's a frequent mowing, but if you want to maintain it that way, Without it renaturalizing <laughs> state language, then maybe we have to mow every two years. I, I, I don't know. <clears throat> Barbara? So I'm, I'm not sure what area you're talking about, but I know that there's an area around the swim area that the road crew mows regularly every summer through the swimming months. And it's already been mowed this year, hasn't it, John? Yes. Yeah, and, and it's mowed every, I think, two weeks all throughout the swimming season. Uh, the whole Camp Comfort area? I, I don't know what the area is. You'd have to ask somebody over the highway department. Yeah. That's what it looks like when you paddle by. It looks like it's been yeah. noticed. So, I mean, regularly. I'm Sarah Gallagher. I, I'm just curious, what, what, is, what makes two years better than four, the state's four years? Is it because we want to reduce over time the amount, I mean, the amount of land that's not naturalized around the pond. I'm just trying to figure out why this is. Four is no mowing versus four, pretty much. We're looking for something in between. Because there are plenty of people that would like to see a total no mow. Right. Yeah. So it's like a compromise, essentially, yeah. is what yeah. you're doing between different camps. Yeah. Okay. I was just trying, wanting to understand. But the, whether it's important to make this a big issue. 
Right. Dan wants to make a last, just the last pitch, is okay. that the Planning Commission would very much appreciate the select board approving these <laughs> and moving this forward to a vote. Um, there's a lot of people that think that it's important that the citizens vote for these amendments. And in that, I want to remind you that you are voting not just for Shrod. Look at the standards and these amendments holistically. You're voting for a lot of things that affect all of the town. It's new tables, it's updated definitions, it's um, things that make it much more current in addition to the Shrod, the River Corridor, the revised flood hazard. And so when you're voting, you're voting for something that's for the whole town. Thank you for coming. <laughs> all right, at this point, select board, we need to talk for a minute. Um, what, I've outlined what we have to do. We have to decide first if we want to make any changes. And if we don't, we have to decide whether we're going to adopt it, which we could do tonight, or whether we're going to warn a vote. Am I in? Are you going to go in? Yeah, I'm trying to discern. Are we in the select board meeting? Or? We're, in the, we're still in the public hearing. OK. My wrist hurts. Which is the select board here of the meeting. Okay. Um, anybody want to comment on it? Let's start with changes. Is that what you wanted to talk about? For me? No. Oh, I thought you raised your hand. Oh, no, no. I see your anybody, rose is on the Let me ask, does any of, the, any of us want to see changes? Or are we going to work with the document as is? I'm fine with the way it is. Yeah. Jordan, you okay? Okay. Then the next question is, do we vote on it? as a select board, or do we warn it and let the town vote on it? Ask the town to vote on it. I think if we were making fewer changes, I, as, a, as a community, I think this is an important issue to vote, vote on. Um, I know there's been a lot of conversation about previous practices and, and what technically can be done, but this is a pretty substantive change to the mm -hmm. regulations. Um, if there were fewer of them, or, or they were more minor, more kind of like clerical, mm -hmm. or even if it were just a, a, a single section um, that was just seeing some revision relative to changes in statute, I think that could warrant a select board vote uh, or ratification, but given how significant it is, I think it would be appropriate to go to a town vote. Are we all in agreement on yes. that? Anybody want to say I'd anything say different? I just, yeah. All right. In that case, we have uh, we have to give at least thirty days warning. We could ostensibly warn it later this week. We could handle that, couldn't we? Um, so I think we're looking at the week of July seventeen or possibly the 24th. Question. Yeah. Um, there's no way to forego it until town meeting to avoid the extra cost of? No, if you do, we have to go back to ground one. There's some rules about when the planning commission started the process. You can't appeal that. You can't ask for um, Jan. There, there's a September 20th deadline. We have one year from when we did our planning commission first hearing. Yeah, the if laws we do not pass these regulations by the one-year mark after our planning commission hearing, we have to start all over again. Yeah, I don't want you to have to start all over again. I'm just saying, do they not ever, you know? As far as I know, no, because this is a process that everybody follows. It's like whatever the name of it is. What is the name of the farmer? I don't know what it is. But yeah, it seems to me that we have to follow that. And how much does a special election or a special whatever Australian ballot? Well, we would just do it by Australian ballot. We would have people come to the town office to vote. So it would be, what, printing up a, a probably we won't get as big a turnout as we would for town meeting. So I imagine you wouldn't print up as many ballots. Yeah, we won't mail them unless people yeah, ask we'll, for we'll it. We mail them uh, uh, unless people call and ask for them, then we mail them. So we wouldn't have to print that many. It, the, 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 the expense is going to be primarily 
the town clerk in my time is primarily. There'll be some printing, some postage. All right. So, what do you say we warn it for the week of the 17th? Is there a particular day that would be a better day for you Are you guys? talking about for an election or for another hearing? An no, election. for an election. An election. I think, Both. I, I think people think of elections as being on Tuesdays. Yeah. So maybe. Okay. Mm -hmm. so how about the 18th? What do you think, guys? Sure. July 18th. July 18th. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then there, does there have to be another informational hearing 15 days before that? Nope. Not according to this sheet you gave me. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm not sure whether we have to vote for this. We probably do, so I let's do it. Oh, yes, you do, because that's on that little certification sheet. Oh. The uh, select board has to vote, and, we have, and I've asked that if you do vote in the select board meeting for this, okay. that I would like a copy of those minutes so that I can attach it to this thing that has to be filed. Okay, and that, oh yes, Barbara. So before you, when you make your motion, is it possible to make a motion to have July 18th as your first priority day, but set a second date in the event, T, because it's vacation time, and Tegan's not here, and I don't know what her vacation schedule is. Okay. So could we say, could, can, can it be that, that if, if say it's not availability, town clerk availability, that would be that day, if she's not, not available, okay. can we can vote on a second date. A week later. Okay. Okay. So then I would entertain a motion to have, to hold a hearing to adopt um, the planning, the planning, the zoning regulations um, as presented to us tonight by Australian ballot on July 18th or July 25th at the convenience of our staff. <laughs> we have to have a hearing? Is that what? Uh, did I call it a hearing? I'm sorry. I meant a vote by Australian ballot. Sorry, Rose. You can clean that up for me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Would somebody make such a motion, please? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. There you go. Can you just um, tell me those dates again, please? Oh, congrats, yeah. July um, 18th with a backup of July 25th. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Oh, and... Yes, now we adjourn. Yeah. Well, next order of business will be to adjourn the meeting of um, May 25th.